minutes? I hope not. Okay, we have Greg Clark. Oh, yes, thank God, yes, yes. How you doing? I'm Greg Clark, this is me. Hi, Greg. Hi. Okay, let's, these directions are rather complicated, so I'm going to give it to you slowly. Oh, you okay? Oh. No, I, oh, darn, just blinked you. I got new contacts and one just popped out. Oh, shoot. Well, good thing I keep two of them in my purse. Sylvia, would you mind handling this gentleman? No, 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 I, 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 I can't see a darn thing without it. Go ahead, Sylvia. Oh, that's shoot. all right. Calm down, Miss Sylvia's going to have you out of here in a jiffy. <laughs> you know what? Actually, you can let somebody go ahead of me, really. I'm in no hurry. I'm in no hurry. Does anybody want to go ahead of this nice young man? <laughs> Baby, ain't nobody wants to go ahead of you. That's okay. Now, it says you need this. I know what I need it for. <laughs> All right, now just slow down. Miss Sylvia's only trying to help. Yeah, look, I appreciate it. You know what? I don't know why people get so embarrassed when they come in here and see Miss Sylvia at the pharmacy. <laughs> Shoot, ain't nothing wrong with having scrotal acne. <laughs> Now, now, don't forget to wash down there with really hot water. And, and whatever you do, don't squeeze them. Because when those things pop, Lord, have mercy. Let me see who's next. Who has explosive diarrhea? Hello? Knowledge is power. Communication is key. Communication is part of daily life and occurs in a wide variety of forms and contexts. In most situations, communication is not at the forefront of our mind and we are not working hard to decide how and what to communicate. There are, however, many circumstances in which more specialist communication is required and this can take a great deal of effort to get right. Pharmacy practice is an example of such a situation. Effective communication is a key component of patient counseling, the art of pharmacy. A pharmacist's communication is an important factor in patient satisfaction, perceptions, overall service quality, and trust. Communication is much more than speaking clearly. It involves listening and understanding. It includes your tone and body language. Much can be said between individuals when no words are even spoken. In the healthcare setting, communication is extremely important. When communicating, the purpose is not just to deliver a message to the recipient, but to bring about a change in that person's knowledge, attitude, and even behavior. Effective communication must be a two-way process, and the success of it depends on the participant's awareness of this. This topic may sound so simple for us, but still, there are some inner-minute ideas of implementations. The reason we selected this topic is to provide new ideas to improve our way of communication. Modes of communication can be categorized into following basic categories. Verbal communication includes the use of actual words for communication. Much of the communication that takes place in the pharmacy is verbal. You spend the day talking on the phone and counseling patients. When you speak, your tone should be pleasant and respectful, your speech clear and not garbled and your volume at an appropriate level. But these are just the foundation of verbal communication. Verbal communication includes the use of jargon or slang. All professions have their own jargon. Imagine using medical jargon to explain something to a patient who is not familiar with the terms you're using. Communicating with the patients can be very difficult when you don't speak the same language. What you say will make very little sense to them. You must remember that most patients don't know medical terminology, even words and phrases that seem straightforward to you. You must take the time to use words that patients understand. Body language refers to the overall impression that's perceived with whom who is talking. It's often said you never get a second chance to make first impression. The impression we have of a person wearing a denim jacket may be different from that of a person wearing a suit. Similarly, a pharmacist wearing a white coat in a clean clinical environment may inspire more confidence in a patient than a pharmacist wearing a scruffy jumper and working in a cluttered environment. Remember so learn to maintain open body language. S. Squarely face the patient. O. Open posture, crossed legs and arms can be interrupted as lack of interest. 
L. Lean toward the patient as appropriate to demonstrate interest. E. Eye contact maintained. R. Relax. Fidgeting may indicate you're impatient. Pay attention to yourself and see if your nonverbal communication says something negative while your verbal communication is positive. High performance communication. High performance communication by the pharmacist includes the use of open ended questions, empathetic responses, and the absence of distractions. Open ended questions allow for more than a yes or no response. It opens up a dialogue between both parties. It's more of a relationship than just a one way giving of information. It helps build relationships with patients and shows interest in their perspective. Open ended questions can also help prevent errors. People tend to pay more attention when answering an open ended question. Asking, Your birth date is March 1, 1956, right? only requires a yes or no response. If the patient didn't hear you well or you didn't read the screen correctly, you may not get a correct response. As you're asking the question, the patient may be anticipating that you'll give the correct date and may not hear you say something differently. It's better to ask the open-ended question, what's your birth date? In this situation, the patient will give something back to you and you will pay attention to their response by writing it down. A significant error could occur if neither party is communicating clearly with the other. Examples of closed questions. Are you taking any medicines at present? Have you ever taken this medicine before? Do you have any questions about the medicine? Did the medicine work for you? Examples of open questions. Describe your symptoms to me. What do you do when the sensation occurs? The funneling technique. It's a method of first finding out the basic information. That means background information by putting open questions and then asking specific closed questions to provide specific details and clarity. In a pharmacy setting where time can be a limiting factor, Using the funneling technique can be useful for directing and focusing a conversation to enable an end point to be achieved more quickly. Avoid firing questions in a way that will lead the patient to answer in another direction. Means, for example, ask him about how many times you take this medicine and the way of taking. And don't say to him, of course you take this medicine after eating, right? It's not enough to know that the patient takes his medicine after eating only. Postprandial ward is not a sign that he takes the medication three times because it is possible that the patient is having his daily meal only twice. Avoid the use of a greatly exaggerated terminology. Hi. Hello. Hey. Uh, I have a personal question. Right. Uh, okay. So, uh, I'm going to the pharmacy and I'm going to the pharmacy and I'm going to the pharmacy and I'm going Something bit you? Like what? Mm, I don't know. It's pretty embarrassing. Can I show you? Okay. Okay, like look. Holy smokes! There, there's something moving in your hair, man. You need to see a doctor. Oh my god. Do scream? Words are, of course, the most powerful drug used by mankind. Empathetic responses allow you to see something from someone else's viewpoint. It shows that you understand what they think or feel about a situation. Recognizing their concern allows the patient to feel more comfortable sharing information with you. Now this medication that your doctor prescribed for you is a topical ointment and you're going to be applying it to your affected area twice a day, once in the morning and once before you go to bed. Now I just wanted to let you know that you might feel a bit of a burning sensation the first few times that you use it. Mr. Rivera, are you okay? I, I could be better. Uh, I just feel a little bit embarrassed. Why is that? Um, I, I feel like if someone sees me with it, then they're going to think I'm weird. I understand this is a very emotional and stressful time for you, Mr. Rivera, but I want to let you know that this is curable and we're going to work as hard as we can to get this under control, okay? okay. Your doctor and I are going to be there every step of the way and I promise I'm always going to be here whenever you have any questions or anything. Feel free always to contact me. That makes me feel better, thank you so much. Okay, great, no problem. Don't ever hesitate to schedule another appointment like this, okay? I'll see you soon, Mr. Rivera. We're going to work on this. Thank you. Communicating in the absence of distractions will help guarantee your message is clearly understood. Distractions could be background noises, other people nearby, or frequent interruptions. 
For example, physical barriers. Pharmacy counters and outpatient dispensing hatches are physical barriers and also may dictate the distance between the pharmacists and patient. This in turn can create problems in developing effective communication. Time. Lack of time can be a major constraint on good communication. A meaningful communication should be developed to provide or obtain concrete information. What to talk about. Um, so then why are you feeling depressed? Well, um, I was abused earlier. Yes. Just, uh, I just don't. I mean, your life doesn't, do I looked in your chart and your life doesn't seem all that bad. So this depression, I think you can get over it. Um, yeah, uh, let me look at my notes here. I know we saw some stuff. Oh, hey, yeah, can I talk to you? Later, I'm gonna finish talking to her. Okay. The most important strategy to achieve openness in communication. Listen to the patient's information and what they are telling you about their experience. Listening is not only hearing what is being said, but what is not being said or only partially being said. There are so many nuances to a conversation that one can't hear unless they truly engage in listening. Body language, facial expression, verbal and non-verbal messages can only be back up if one is fully engaged, both hearing and listening. So, here's a few tips that would improve the delivery of pharmacists from a listening perspective. 1. Stop talking. Let your patients tell their story. 2. Get ready to listen. Remove distractions, including laptops, phones. 3. Be patient. Put them at ease and let them share their concerns. 4. Listen for what's not being said. Listen with your eyes as well. 5. Be empathetic. Try to understand the patient's point of view. Through these approaches, pharmacists can add up how patients experience medications to their own pharmacotherapeutic knowledge. Confidentiality Matters related to health and illness is highly private affairs. Therefore, it is important that privacy and confidentiality are assured in the practice of pharmacy private communication facilities. Environment Psychological privacy Use of proper voice, eye contact, leaning forward and concentrating on the person and their problem helps in generating confidentiality. Ethical guidelines and privacy laws should be followed. For example, actively seek out information to make informed decisions. Properly inform each patient about drug therapy and reasonable alternatives. Respect the right of a confident patient to accept or reject any treatment, care, or other professional services. Avoid discriminating against any patient on grounds such as age, gender, religion, or economic status. Don't exploit a patient for personal advantage. Don't abandon the professional relationship with the patient in situations where the patient is unable to pay. Appropriate steps to prevent and act upon the misuse or abuse of substances by patients, co-workers, colleagues or other health professionals. The pharmacist should strongly resist every attempt compromising the independence of his career. I'm Stella Shaban Grechak, I'm Anna Gauss Koko, I'm from Zagreb, Croatia. And I'm from Zagreb, Croatia. I think I was about eight years old. My grandfather used to take me for long walks through the woods. I remember that pleasant and fascinating scent of pureness. As I grew up, I realized there was a whole world of science behind it, and I really wanted to learn all about it. And then, all those different jars. My days consisted of constant learning and researching. It was really at that point when I set my foundation as a future pharmacist. I remember many sleepless nights, lots of books and gallons of coffee. Yeah, lots of coffee. It sounds to me like a true pharmacist. On my way to work, patients, neighbors, friends, approach me and ask for all kinds of advice. We live in a fast and modern age. People miss attention, human sympathy and sincere interest. And that's the thing I love the most about my profession. Communication with people. 
That's why a role of a pharmacist is so important. We also organize therapy at retirement homes, individual consultations about healthy living, proper dieting, counsel the physicians about medical treatment for the elderly, and try to help them enjoy their old age as much as possible. We are fully equipped for making medicines, creams, lotions to specific needs of our patients. One of the most important parts of our profession is constant learning. We organize workshops on different subjects, asthma, hypertension, diabetes, and in this way we help ourselves and our colleagues to stay updated and to follow up professional subjects. I'm very happy to be a part of the education team in our company. And not to forget our colleagues, they make us better from day to day and make us love our job even more. Because we work, learn and smile together. And in the end, a pharmacy job is constantly evolving and holding step with the future. So that all people on this planet could get the best medical care they deserve. A pharmacist's job is never done. Specific communication challenges. As a communicator, we have to adapt to or be reflected to the styles and pattern of those to whom we are communicating. Manners and timings of behavior of everyone are different and different in different situations. We have to communicate differently to different ones in different times. In this section, we will discuss some of the communication challenges you may face in the pharmacy. Because you will see many different people, some of them may be in one or more of the following categories. Being prepared to communicate in these situations will make counseling much more satisfying for both you and the patient. Drug abuser Telling the difference between a legitimate patient and a drug abuser isn't easy. The drug-seeking individual may be unfamiliar to you. They could be a person who claims to be from out of town and has lost or forgotten a prescription of medication. Or the drug-seeker may actually be familiar to you, such as another practitioner, co-worker, friend or relative. A drug abusers or doctor shoppers often possess similar traits and modus operandi. Recognizing these characteristics and modus operandi is the first step to identifying the drug-seeking patient who may be attempting to manipulate you in order to obtain desired medications. Common characteristics of the drug abuser Unusual behavior in the waiting room Assertive personality Often demanding immediate action Unusual appearance Extremes of either slovenliness or being overdressed May show unusual knowledge of controlled substances and or gives medical history with textbook symptoms or gives evasive or vague answers to questions regarding medical history Reluctant or unwilling to provide reference information will often request a specific controlled drug and is reluctant to try a different drug. May exaggerate medical problems and or stimulate symptoms. May exhibit mood disturbance, suicidal thoughts, lack of impulse control, thought disorders. Cutaneous signs of drug abuse. Skin drugs and related scars on the neck, axilla, forearm, wrist, foot and ankle. Such marks are usually multiple, hyperpigmented and linear. New lesions may be inflamed, show signs of pop scars from subcutaneous injections. Modus operandi often used by the drug-seeking patient include calls or comes in after regular hours, states he she is traveling through town, visiting friends or relatives not a permanent resident, Fence psychological problems such as anxiety, insomnia, fatigue or depression in an effort to obtain stimulants or depressants states that specific non-narcotic analgesics don't work or that she's allergic to them, states that a prescription has been lost or stolen and needs replacing, deceives the practitioner such as by requesting refills more often than originally prescribed, pressures the pharmacist by eliciting sympathy or guilt or by direct threats, utilizes a child or an elderly person when seeking methylphenidate or pain medication, Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Dr. Baker. What brings you in today? Hey, man, all right. I'm just in a lot of pain. I just can't sleep, I can't eat, can't do anything, you know? Well, that's too bad. Well, I'm definitely here to help you. Let me let me just take a look. Open up real big. 
see if I see any swelling or anything like that. Well, I definitely see some decay actually down here, opposite oh. of where you're. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it's there too. Man. I'm, I'll probably need a couple of scrubs then. Okay. Well, what would you say on the scale of one to ten? Your what kind of pain are you one experiencing? One to ten. Oh man, it's at least fifteen and a half. Fifteen and a half. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, what we have to do is we're, I'm going to have to take some radiographs. Let's make sure we get a diagnosis of what's no, causing no, no. the pain. No, I don't have time for that, man. My dentist, he's on vacation. He usually just writes a script. I actually I have a script right here already kind of filled out. Oh, um, no, 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 no. I'm, I just, I'm if sorry. you just sign this, so we can I, just get, I can just get out of here. It's Friday. I mean, you can just leave now. No, I'm sorry. You need to leave right now. No. If you're really experiencing that much pain, you need to go to the ER. No, man. Trust me. Okay, straight Please up. Please leave now. Straight up, man. Leave. If you sign this... Leave now. If no. you sign this, we go halves. Dude, we go halves on this. Please. Please. Seriously. Oh, no. No. Okay. What you should do when confronted by a suspected drug abuser? Perform a through examination appropriate to the condition. Document examination results and questions you ask the patient. Request picture ID or other ID and social security number. Photocopy these documents and include in the patient's record. Call a previous doctor, pharmacist, or hospital to confirm patient's story. Confirm a telephone number if provided by the patient. Confirm the current address at each visit. Don't. Take their word for it when you are suspicious. Dispense drug just to get rid of drug-seeking patients. Prescribe, dispense, or administer controlled substances outside the scope of your professional practice or in the absence of a formal practitioner-patient relationship. Health literacy can have an impact on patient communication and patient safety. It is known that there is a high rate of adverse events as a result of communication breakdowns. Many studies have shown that the skills required to understand and to use health information are frequently beyond those of the average patient. Health literacy is defined as a constellation of skills that constitute the ability to perform the basic reading and numerical tasks required to function in the healthcare environment. In addition to remaining open to a patient's experience, a pharmacist should also make sure the patient is receiving information that he or she understands. A common misconception may be that health literacy is only an issue for low-income patients. Pharmacists should not take for granted that patients with adequate literacy skills can understand the sometimes confusing language used in prescription directions. Pharmacists always err on the side of caution, striving for communication that is clear, free of pharmacy lingo, and includes patient feedback, soliciting questions from the patient to ensure understanding of the information given. Signs that people may have difficulty reading 1. It may take a long time for them to fill out a form or they may have someone else to do it for them. 2. They may be very quiet when a healthcare worker goes over information. 3. They may state they will read over the information when they get home. 4. They may state they forgot their glasses. 5. They may state the lighting is poor. And I'm, I'm sorry your wife wasn't able to join us today so that we could talk about all this together, but I do want to discuss some things that you can do to take care of your heart. Okay. And uh, I have a booklet that I'm going to review mm -hmm. with you and that I'm going to give you to take home that I think will be helpful. So are you checking your weight each day? No, I, I don't. Uh, do I need to? Yes, it, it actually can be very helpful. Uh, you know, one of the things you'll notice when your heart isn't pumping well is that extra fluid may build up in your body and that fluid is heavy so what you'll notice when you start building up fluid or holding on to fluid is your weight will go up and by checking your weight each morning after you go to the bathroom but before you eat and before you get dressed it can be a good way to see how things are going what would I be looking for in a change that's a great question what you'd be looking for is a sudden increase in your weight, say four or more pounds in a week. Okay. So do you have a working scale at home? Yes. And it sounds like you'd be willing to check your weight each morning. Yes, I could do that. And, Great. Uh, write it down. Wonderful. And uh, I've got a spot here at the end of the booklet 
a place where you can actually write it down each day. Okay. So, I think we've got a good plan for you to monitor how your heart's doing. And since your wife wasn't able to join you today, how are you going to explain this to her when you get home? Well, um, if the heart is not pumping correctly, fluid might build up, and the fluid is heavy, and so I should be checking my weight every morning. After I go to the bathroom, but before I eat, and I should write it down. Excellent. That's great. And when would you, would you think you might need to make a phone call? Do you remember what we said was the target? Oh, well, here it is. Uh, if my weight goes up by more than four pounds in one week, I, I could call in. Wonderful. That's, that's a great plan. And uh, when do you plan to start checking your weight? Tomorrow morning. Fantastic. So what other questions do you have for me? I can't think of anything right now. Great. Thank you. As we all know, working is stressful. Working in the healthcare field is even more stressful because we are dealing with people's lives. When people are sick, their well-being are affected and they may be become emotionally unstable and are vulnerable to many obstacles. Therefore, we as pharmacists should be more patient and understanding. Identify the patient's problem. Once you've identified the patient's problem, it will be easier for you to find a solution to help fulfill the patient's needs. Be positive, smile. Sometimes patients have been waiting a long time in the hospital and being ill is unpleasant. They may come to the pharmacy with a gloomy mood and just by smiling, we're showing that we're willing to help them by preparing their medications. Show empathy. Some patients won't be soothed by your extra attention and may become belligerent, demanding to know such things as Why aren't my medications ready yet? Your calm approach in answering such obviously loaded questions can prevent anger from turning into a behavioral crisis. Listen to what they have to say. Most patients want to be heard. By listening to them, it shows that we're willing to help them and that we understand how they feel. If the patient has been talking for a long time, we gently interrupt him by repeating his problems and show we'll help him solve his problems and then lead him to the waiting room. Don't take the patient's actions or words personally. Some patients may be rude or frustrated over something or someone. This is because they're sick. Their well-being is affected and their needs are not being met. Therefore, we shouldn't take their words or actions personally and we should be more patient and understanding towards them. Always greet the patient and call the patient's name by Mr. or Mrs. X. Let's look at two dialogues between a pharmacist and an angry patient, in which the pharmacist doesn't use the process described before. In the first dialogue, the pharmacist is aggressive. In the second, he is non-assertive. Then, let's look at how the same dialogue could be more productive if the process is used. Scenario A 45-year-old female patient enters the pharmacy and tosses a new prescription on the counter. She is obviously very agitated. The pharmacist has never met her before. Here! That's not going to take long, is it? Well, I got four other patients in front of you, so it's going to take about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? You've got to be kidding. I had a 2 o'clock doctor appointment and he didn't even see me until 3.15. Now I'm late for my next appointment. You people must think we have nothing better to do than to wait for you. Besides, all you have to do is throw a few damn pills in a bottle. What could take so long? I do more than just throw a few damn pills in a bottle. Look, lady, I have four other people in front of you, and it's gonna take 20 minutes. Take it or leave it. It's not my fault the doctor made you late. Just give me my prescription back. I'll take it elsewhere. This pharmacist was aggressive, defensive, and antagonistic. The patient may have been difficult to deal with, insulting, and disrespectful. But this doesn't give the pharmacist permission to be disrespectful. This pharmacist did not see this situation as an opportunity to assist this patient. Assisting the patient didn't mean that the pharmacist had to fill the prescription in 5 minutes or less. 
If other patients were waiting, their needs had to be considered and respected along with those of current patients. Yet, the patient could have been offered other options. We will discuss this later. Here, that's not going to take long, is it? Oh, well, there are four other patients waiting for their prescriptions, so it's going to take about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? You've got to be kidding. I had a 2 o'clock doctor appointment and he didn't even see me until 3.15. Now I'm late for my next appointment. You people must think we have nothing better to do than to wait for you. Besides, all you have to do is throw a few damn pills in a bottle. What could take so long? Sorry. Sorry? Is that the best you can do? This is pathetic. If you can't get my prescription for me in 5 minutes, I'll take it elsewhere. I'll do the best I can. No, you don't understand. I want it in less than five minutes. What is wrong with you people? Okay, I'll get it for you right away. Sorry. Well, you ought to be sorry. Just get me my prescription. This pharmacist is non-assertive and actually disrespects himself to please an abusive patient. This will create future problems because the patient now knows that if she complains enough, she will get what she wants. In addition, other patients who are waiting may become angry because the pharmacist put this new patient ahead of them. If other patients were not present, this might be an alternative. The new patient should have been told. Mrs. Smith, since you are in such a hurry, I'm going to fill your prescription first. I do want you to know I'm making an exception and may not be able to do this again in the future. While the pharmacist should be as helpful and respectful as possible, he doesn't have to apologize for this patient's problems. He didn't create these problems. Here, that's not going to take long, is it? Uh, I have four other patients waiting for prescriptions, so it will be about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? You've got to be kidding. I had a 2 o'clock doctor appointment and he didn't even see me until 3.15. Now I'm late for my next appointment. You people must think we have nothing better to do than to wait for you. Besides, all you have to do is throw a few damn pills in a bottle. What could take so long? It sounds like you've had a very frustrating day. It's aggravating when you're busy and people don't keep their appointment times. Again, I do have four other patients in front of you, so it will take 20 minutes. I want to be sure I am accurate when I prepare my patients' medications for them. This is ridiculous. What the hell is wrong with you people? You and the doctor are all alike. Mrs. Smith, I know you are frustrated and I want to get your prescription for you as fast as I can, but I don't want to be sworn at or yell that. If you continue to swear and yell at me, I will ask you to leave. Now, I'd like to get started so you aren't delayed anymore. Just give me my prescription. If you can't get in 5 minutes, I'll take it elsewhere. I don't have time to wait. If that's what you feel you need to do, I understand. Is there a pharmacy you plan to go to that I can call ahead and tell them you are on the way so they can get started? Either that or would you like to use the phone and call your next appointment and let them know you're running late? I don't know. Just give me the prescription. Here you are. I hope you get to your next appointment on time. This pharmacist doesn't allow the patient's bad day to ruin his. He empathizes with the patient, but also sets limits by telling her he doesn't want to be sworn at or yelled at. He disapproved of her behavior but still respected her. Assertive communication respects oneself and the other. When it is clear to this pharmacist that nothing he will say or do will work with this patient, he still doesn't take it personally. His offer to call another pharmacy displays his interest in helping her, even if she is difficult. This powerful message can have unlimited positive impact on her and any other patients observing what took place. The pharmacist focused on serving without losing his own self-respect. Dealing with difficult patients will always be a challenge. Put your finesse in diffusing and managing anger will keep the focus on getting the patient healthy and protect you from unwarranted legal action. Older adults. As more of the population ages, you will encounter greater numbers of older adults in your pharmacy. They will be receiving multiple medications and may have many questions for you. It's imperative that you treat them with the same respect you give all your patients. Unfortunately, older adults often encounter elder speak from younger people. Elder speak is very similar to baby talk. Some people talk to the elderly with simple and brief sentences. They use a higher pitch tone and volume. Phrases are repeated. The rate of speech is slower and more pronounced. All of these things are very patronizing to the elderly person. When speaking with the older adult, you should make sure your speech is clear. You do not need to raise your voice. Raising your voice and speaking louder may actually make it more difficult to be heard and understood. There is no need to use short and simple sentences. You should look directly at the person you're speaking to. Don't chew gum or have candy in your mouth, and don't cover your mouth with your hand as you talk. 
Another way to respectfully communicate with the older adults is to address them by name. If you don't know their name, calling someone ma'am or sir is appropriate. Mr. Stepania, good morning. It is never appropriate to call someone honey, dear, or sweetie. These are condescending terms when used outside of an intimate relationship. Embarrassments. Most patients find some embarrassment when discussing some things, such as hemorrhoids, family planning, matters relating to sex, enemas, and so on. Signs which shows you that the patient is embarrassed. 1. To avoid being seen to your eye. 2. Facial flushing. 3. Stuttering. 4. Stability in place. 5. To speak quickly and nervous. What to do about it? 1. Be aware of issues that could cause embarrassment for your patient and try to start with the subject first. 2. Speak to him in a special place and not on the public. 3. Discuss the patient's problem in a clear, direct, and scientific way. 4. Avoid joking completely. Deaf and hard of hearing patients. It is likely that you will encounter patients with some type of hearing loss. Not everyone who is hard of hearing agrees on their preferred method of communication. When you assist patients who are deaf or hard of hearing, you should ask how they prefer to communicate. You can then make a note of this in the computer or their chart for others. Many people may prefer to use notes. In this case, you should write legibly. You will also want to be in a well-lit area, especially for those who also have impaired vision. You should not assume that everyone prefers notes. However, about 80% of deaf people cannot read well enough to have a good understanding of what they are reading. This doesn't mean deaf people are unintelligent. The language they are most accustomed to is very different from written language that hearing people use. This makes clear communication more difficult. Some people may lip read. Some words and meanings may not be clear to patients who lip read. If someone is lip reading, it is important for you to face them. Talk at a moderate pace and normal volume, and do not over exaggerate words. It is easier to lip read if the person speaking doesn't have facial hair around her lips or anything in their mouth. Another method of communicating is through the use of an interpreter. If an interpreter is present, you should look at the person you're talking to, not at the interpreter. It is actually considered rude in the deaf community to not have eye contact when speaking. However, most frequently a friend or family member may act as an interpreter. It is especially important in these situations that you speak directly to the patient and allow them to respond to you. It is not appropriate for you to ask the interpreter how long has she been coughing and get the response from the interpreter. The questions should be directed to and answered by the patient herself. It's critical that you ask open-ended questions to be sure that the patient understands you. A yes or no response may not indicate full understanding of what you've said. You must also exhibit patience. Any frustration or impatience will be conveyed by your body language and facial expressions. It is more polite if you let the deaf or hard of hearing person take the lead in their communication style and it will be more productive for both parties. Pharmacist Physician Communication Hello, how are you? I'm well. I have a prescription. Okay. Is this for you? That's my father. Father. Blood thinner. You know, there's another drug out on the market that I personally like a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. My patients are, they're a lot happier with the other drug. Huh. If you like, I can write it down for you. But the doctor prefers this one. Yes. I prefer the other one. But he likes this one. But I like that one. Doctor, pharmacist, doctor, pharmacist. I'll go with the pharmacist. I'm going with the pharmacist. Yes, sir. I'm taking this to the doctor. I'm getting a new prescription, and I'll be back, Mr. Pharmacist. I'm glad. I'm going with you. Thank you, sir. 
As Dr. Abdelmoula and others said, the relationship between the physician and community pharmacist has been described as a complex one. Pharmacists know a lot about the drugs. Physicians know a lot about diagnosis and treatment. When a pharmacist discovers an allergy, a contraindication, a dangerous dose, or an unclear prescription, he must be able to pick up the telephone or in some way contact the physician to rectify the situation. In this way, pharmacists cannot only avoid obvious errors and problems, but can also work towards the elusive goal of optimal drug therapy. Hello, this is Dr. Jo. Hi, Dr. Jo. This is Susie from the hospital pharmacy. I'm calling about the amlodipine prescription for Mr. Williams. I'm not sure if you're aware, but amlodipine isn't on the formulary anymore. What about an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker? The patient already has a chronic cough because of pretty severe asthma. Well, another option would be to fill out a non-formulary request form. Under the circumstances, that's probably the best thing to do. Do you have a form easily available or should I send one up? I would really appreciate it if you could send one up. I'm seeing patients in the clinic right now and I'm running a little late. Sure, no problem. Great, thanks very much for your help. The real danger, of course, is that an impaired working relationship between two such essential healthcare professionals carries with it the potential for adverse effects on patient care and patient outcome. Hello, this is Dr. Jo. This is Susie from the hospital pharmacy. Don't you know we don't carry amlodipine anymore? It's too expensive. I pick your pardon? Amlodipine, we don't carry it. Why not? It's too expensive. Well, I have a patient who's been on other capsule channel blockers but developed edema. I thought amlodipine caused less edema than methodipine or even dutiazam. Edema, shmedema, it's not on the formulary. I don't understand, it was on the formulary last month. Not anymore, it isn't, not as of two weeks ago. What I'm supposed to do now? Were you prescribing it for hypertension? Yes, I was. What's the matter with the beta blocker? The patient has asthma. Then what about the diuretic? He also has gut and hyperlipidemia. Well, I guess you got a problem there, doctor. I guess that's why your parents sold out the big bucks to send you to medical school, right? Is there someone else from the pharmacy I could speak to? Be prepared with specific questions, facts, or recommendations. Stay within the pharmacist's area of expertise. Never interrupt a physician-patient interaction except for life-threatening cases. Listen carefully, assess the information or question, and ask for clarification. Pharmacist, pharmacist communication. The relationship between the pharmacists should be on the basis of cooperation on the performance of duty. The pharmacist should not hurt his colleagues by derogation of their scientific, literary, and physical status or by any other means. Pharmacists should consider the interest of the patient in the first place in case the issuance of any action from another colleague in healthcare reflects the poor in professional ethics or incompetence. Pharmacists should appreciate and respect the concept of value and importance of teamwork. Communicate with the rest of the staff with respect and take into account individual differences among them. Poor communication. Poor communication skill between pharmacists and patients leads to 1. Inaccurate patient medication history. 2. Inappropriate therapeutic decisions. 3. Leads to patient confusion. 4. Patient disinterest and non compliance. Here you go. Okay. Can you sign here for me? Yeah. Oh. Have a good day. You too. Hi, how can I help you? Um, maybe see from my daughter. Okay. Um, and her name's out here? Kelly Ramirez. Hi. Um, Alright, so your insurance is up to date, and I see here that you're picking up an inhaler for her. Thank you, thank you. And I'll be right back. Okay, so here I have the inhaler. Okay. 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 So this is how you're going to use it, right? You're going to shake it like this. Shake it? Yes, shake, shake it. it. Okay. Then you're going to put the spacer on. Spacer? There's a spacer in the back. Oh. Okay, you're going to put the oh, spacer okay. on. Okay. Before, before you put it on your mouth, you're going to exhale, right? Okay. Okay. Exhale. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Put the spacer in your mouth. Okay. okay. The mouth. The mouth. Right. She's going to inhale. Thank like you. that, okay? And don't forget to push down. Like that. Do you understand? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Any questions? No. Thank Remember, you. Thank you. Thank you. If you could um, sign here for me, please, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There you go. Oh, and also the labels are in the back. The label? Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I am here to pick up my medication. Hi, Kelly. How are you feeling? Better. Good. I just wanted to let you know that I'm really sorry that you had to come to the hospital because of your asthma attack. But just know that it is completely preventable if you've been using your inhaler correctly. Mm -hmm. So can you just really quickly show me how you've been using the inhaler? Uh, yeah. hablando del inhalador? Sí, mamá. Enseñale entonces como yo te enseñé en la casa. Do you have a spacer with that? Um, oh, yeah, it's at home. So my mom just told me that I'm supposed to press down and inhale. Ah, I know exactly what you've been doing wrong. So you're actually supposed to exhale before you push down on the inhaler. Mamá. Pero eso fue lo que me dijeron a mí en la farmacia. We all need to understand that even if we have great knowledge and fail to present it or fail to communicate the same to the world, it will have no value.